you want to open up with me to Hebrews chapter 3, it's page 1002 in your pew Bibles, I believe. Uh, feel free to shout out a corrective if I'm wrong about that, but I believe it's 1002. And we're going to continue uh, part three of this message series, Salvation, Sabbath, and Saving Faith. It was interesting as we were just singing some of the basic songs, like almost the kids' songs of the faith just now, you know, it's kind of neat. I know we just came through vacation Bible school, and we'll probably do some testimonies on that next week. I don't want to spring that on anybody, but uh, maybe next week we'll, we'll hear um, from some of the people that work. And so if you have one, by the way, if you have a testimony about VBS that you want to share, kind of, share, kind of be ready. Between now and next week, maybe we'll go ahead and get that done uh, next week. But As we were singing, now I am free in Christ. And I was just contemplating, just meditating on what that means that we're free. And even the context of this message, of this passage that we're getting ready to, to work through here in just a moment as we continue through in Hebrews. What does it mean to be saved? What are we free from? Um, we're not free to act the fool, right? I mean, we're not free to live just any old way we want. Oh, got my get out of hell free card. I'm, I'm free to live now, do whatever I want. No worries there. If that's your attitude, friend, I, I have to ask you to meditate and see if you're even born again. Um, but what are we free from? We're free from the penalty of sin. We won't perish for all of eternity because of our sin, if we're born again. We're free from that future. Uh, we're free from the fear of death. Uh, we're free from God's judgment against our sin. We're free to obey him. Does that make sense? Free to obey him? Because we're not always free to obey him. We're not free to obey him before we get converted because we don't want to obey him. We don't, obeying him is not in our lexicon um, until God opens our eyes to the truth. So we're, we're free to obey. And I think that's really, really important. And it, it is the context of this. Uh, that those who didn't enter the promised land didn't enter because of their lack of faith. When they looked at the promised land, they didn't see freedom. They saw fear risk, challenge, overwhelming odds, not freedom, but had they just crossed over, had they just entered the fight in faith, God would have delivered the promised land to them and the Bible would look vastly different, but they didn't do that, they rebelled. So, Last week we took some time to see how God equates disbelief, that state of not believing on Christ, in Jesus as God, as Jesus as Lord, as Jesus as Savior, that trifecta of truth. God equates not believing that with an evil heart. It's evil. It's evil. You're evil because you don't see God in all of this. It's, it's evil that keeps you from seeing it. It's your evil. Um, world doesn't like to hear that. It's antithetical to the we're all good people who have just gone astray lie. Um, we're not all good people. We're all terrible people. And um, only by God's grace are we able to do anything that even emulates God's goodness at all. And he's, he's gifted many of us to do that. He's, he, we're made in his image. Praise Jesus. We're made in his image and we're able to love and we're able to do right. and We're able to tip well, <laughs> you know, whatever good thing that you do. That's all by God's grace. Everything we do that's good is by His grace and because we're made in His image. It's, amazing. it's an amazing thing. Um, we went back last week to the Old Testament Israel to see what such a falsely professed trust in God looked like. Where they said they believed in God, but it didn't carry through into the courage to step into the promised land. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. Until, oop, and then you pull up short, except this one. I don't trust you in this one. Can I take the wheel for a minute? Who's ever been there before? I, whoops, whoops. Here, I see some twists and turns up there. Maybe slide on over, buddy, and let me drive for a minute. We end up like driving off the cliff. because We don't see, he sees. But, but we, all, we all have those moments. But that was the nature of their heart, was that they didn't truly believe. Even after all they'd seen. So there was false faith then, 
faith in name only, where you say that you believe in Yahweh, but you don't. But it's also in the church today. And uh, false teachers and false believers have infiltrated the local church today, and it will continue. It's, it's always been. It's been since church day one, day one of the church, we had false teachers trying to make their way in and, and succeeding. God calls them tares amongst the wheat. Um, if you've read the parables, it's the tares amongst the wheat. The enemy came in at some night and planted weeds among the wheat, and the workers came in the next day and said, Master, 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 there's tares amongst the wheat. He's like, yep, there are. The enemy must have come and sown tares amongst the wheat. Weeds in the wheat. Yep, he sure did. What should we do? Should we go out and tear up all those weeds? And Jesus says, nope, leave them. If we start tearing out the weeds, we're going to tear out some of the wheat too. So just leave it. Leave it alone. And when everything matures, there's, it's such a, Jesus is such a great teacher. When everything matures, we're going to harvest the good. And the chaff, the stuff that's not good, the wheat will be evident and we'll burn that in, in the fire. So we have that in the local body today, every local church. It's not like it's a mystery. God said that this would happen, that there would be false teachers. If the truth is our standard, then false teaching has to be the attack, right? You have to attack truth with false truth or near truth or not quite truth and that's what the enemy does that's his tactic it's always been and if you go back to the garden of eden you can see it right there did god really say you know that you shouldn't eat of the tree any tree of the garden and he's like yeah he did he said we couldn't eat of any of the trees of the garden or, or 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 touch it lest we die that's not what he said that's not what he said it's flat out not what he said but but the enemy starts sowing those seeds of doubt you know and then did god that how many christians just by a hand vote you think you know a passage pretty well, and then you go read it like, hey, I forgot about that part. Anyone? Wow, well, yeah, that there's that thing in there. That's why it's so important that we continually read God's Word, because we forget stuff. We forget context. We forget the little nuances. We forget the little things that are God's provided for us so richly. We forget. It's important to be in the book. But, but we want to take a look today at, at, at true faith versus false faith, or a falsely proclaimed faith faith and what false teachers kind of look like and god makes this distinction um so let's let's go ahead and, and get at it instead of me bumping my gums all right hebrews three twelve. Let, let's read that take care brothers you can read that as brothers and sisters and still be true to the text take care brothers lest there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living god the writer of hebrews encourages each person who calls themselves a believer to take care Right there. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. So he calls them to take care, to ensure that their faith is genuine. God doesn't ask you to look for how much faith, how much faith you have. He asks you to look for the genuine quality of your faith. That's what we're looking for. Do we have the genuine article? Is my faith genuine? Am I truly trusting in Christ? And that's what we're to look at. Paul gives a similar admonition in 2 Corinthians 3.5 when he tells us to constantly examine ourselves, to see if we're in the faith, and then to test ourselves, to make sure that we're in the faith. It should be a constant, reflective work on the, on the part of the saint to examine their walk, to examine my speech, to examine my conduct, to examine my attitudes, while I'm weighing it against the Word of God to see where God's doing work, where I need to submit more, what I need to confess, where I need to devote myself. It's, it, it's a never-ending process of growth. It's just like when you go to the gym, and I hate to use this analogy because I don't go to the gym. I'm, you know, obviously, I'm, tell that. Um, but, but when you go to the gym, and you're in the gym, there's a couple of you I see looking. Rob's got like big arms bigger than my legs. And, and a few of you are in here working out, I know. Um, I won't list all the names, but please don't leave the church because I didn't say your name because you go to the gym. So, but then you go into the gym and you're looking and you're working this and you look in that mirror and you go, hey, what's that? Right? What's that thing? I better do an extra exercise to get to that thing. Cause, and, that's, and, and no one says, oh, I you're shaming or no no you're not you're you're trying to achieve a goal and you go into a place with what mirrors everywhere who doesn't go to the gym just because there's mirrors everywhere anyone okay <coughs> it's terrible so you go a place with mirrors everywhere a place where you can be examined where you can see every war every piece of everything is is brought into full view so you know 
where to go to work. It's, it's very similar to Christianity. We want the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ to expose the darkness in us so that we can work towards righteousness in those areas. We can petition the Lord in those areas. It's, it's, it's not a mystery, it's, it, but it's, it's, it's difficult. A lot of times we want to think we've arrived, we're Christians, good. Next. It's, 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 not, it's not like that at all. So how do we test ourselves? Uh, we test ourselves by devoting ourselves to God's word and examining ourselves to see if we believe rightly. Um, to see if we, we believe not in vain. That, that we haven't placed our faith in a false gospel, that we're not following a, a Jesus that Scripture doesn't describe, that we haven't carved an idol out of some our imagination and our desires and we're saying, oh Jesus, when it's really our desires and our flesh, we need to constantly be honing ourselves and constantly weighing ourselves against God's Word. And, and so we're doing that and, and, and we look to see if we're bearing fruit for the kingdom and we look to see if we're filled with the Holy Spirit because Romans tells us, you're not a child of God if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. You, 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 that's evidence of your, that you're saved, that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. That God in you, working to make you more like Christ. Sanctifying you, that sanctifying work. So we need to constantly look. It shouldn't be a joyless exercise. It should be a joyful exercise. Hey, I know I'm saved. i got some work to do. i got to submit some more. Let's, let's do this. I want to be all I can be for Christ. It should be a... Not a, oh, woe is me, I'm terrible. Not that. God's not asking you to hate yourself. He's just asking you to objectively observe yourself and, and to take a look and, and to see what he's telling you uh, to do. So, but we also have to look at our brothers and sisters. and Look at their walks to see if any of them may have believed in vain or are captive to sin through unrepentance. And both of those things can exist. So, Some are not believers and need to be evangelized. So let's take a look here. As we look, I'm going to read Hebrews 3.12 one more time. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away uh, from the living God. Uh, we see imposters in the local church in Titus 1 where Paul warns Titus about false teachers who, who sneak into the church. And we find that in Titus 1, 10 through 11 and 15 through 16. It's up on the screen there for you. Uh, this isn't a one-time event here. It's, it's in the Bible. It's in the book God wrote us, so we need to be, keep our eyes open. There are many, many. This is century one now, okay? This is century one. There are many who are insubordinate. They're empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They say they're Christians, but they're bringing a bunch of law with them, right? They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable. They are disobedient. They are unfit for any good work. That's not a brother or sister in Christ. That's a false teacher who falsely proclaims to be your brother or sister in Christ who comes into the church with false teaching. We don't welcome them as brothers and sisters. We evangelize them as lost people. And if they continue to cause division, we push them out of the fellowship so their cancer can't grow here. I mean, it really is a strong admonition. And an unbelieving heart isn't passive. We see that again here in Hebrews uh, 3.12. An unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Uh, an unbelieving heart is never passive. It actually drives you away uh, from the truth of Christ. And false teachers are a way that that happens. So we know false teachers are not true believers, but what about those who profess to trust in Jesus, but are easily seduced by false teaching. They're not doing the teaching, but they're easily drawn away. Let's look at Hebrews 3.13, the next verse. So you got unbelievers, first category, 12, verse 13. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now, you can have a non-believer who's disobedient, and you can have a believer who's in a season of disobedience. Folks, we can't tell the difference, to be honest with you. When I'm looking at that in myself or other people, I can't tell the difference between a true believer who's just in complete abject disobedience and a non-believer. God doesn't even require us to make that call. All right, We're not trying to make that call. That's not my job to now judge you. Oh, you're saved. Oh, you're not. All I can do is look at your fruit, say you look like maybe unsaved, so I'm going to do, what do we do with unsaved people? We share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Isn't that right? You just keep coming with the truth. You keep coming with the truth. And, that, and that's what we're supposed to do. 
So uh, false believers are in the local church. They don't bear fruit for God's kingdom. But true believers who are not maturing or strong also don't bear fruit for God's kingdom. Let's take a look here at the parable Jesus told. Luke 8, 4 through 8. Those of us that were in Bible study together this morning are snickering at me because I couldn't find this verse and it's in my sermon notes. Okay, that's okay. Here we go. Here Jesus said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed, some fell among the path and was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock. And as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Some fell among thorns and the thorns grew up where it was and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. All right, so we have categories of, of receivers here. We have a lost person who the word hits them like it's bouncing off a wall. It has no effect. We have a lost person who acts like they believe for a minute, but they don't really have a genuine root in Christ and that they act religious for a while, but the minute persecution comes, they're gone because they weren't believers in the, in the first place. And then we have a couple categories of believer here in the bottom, the last two, and that's what we're looking at. So Jesus explains this third category, the believer who's choked out, in Luke 8, 9 through 10. He says this. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, As for what fell among the thorns, they are those that hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked by cares and by riches and the pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. So we see there a distinction. There are false Christians who aren't going to grow because they don't have a root. And then there's true Christians that for a season are kind of choked out by the flesh. They're, they're just kind of, they're not, they're not bearing fruit there. So that's where the church comes in. And that's why the church is so important. The local church is designed to build mature Christians so that you can work out of this condition. So that you can be encouraged out of this condition. So that you can be taught and motivated to now go and bear fruit. And we, and we see it here in Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 14. This is about the church. This is why the local church is important. He gave the apostles, he gave the prophets, he gave the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, just don't even look up, don't even show hands. Uh, how many of you just know Christians that have never grown? They say they're Christians, they just never grow. They refuse almost to embrace the doctrines of the faith. But God wants us to grow, to mature manhood, uh, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Um, where was I? Okay, so... <laughs> we're talking about the church and, and the purpose for the church. The purpose for the church is to grow Christians. The purpose for the church isn't so that you can come and get 40 minutes in a week and call it good and then leave. If that's what you're doing, you are, you're malnourished. You, are, um, you may think you have what it takes to succeed for Christ and to do great things for the Lord, but you, you can't. You, apart from fellowship, we're ill-equipped. All of us are. All of us are. We need to sit under the sound teaching of biblically qualified teachers. We need to be in fellowship with one another. Dare I say to let others see our lives? To let others see our walk? To let others see our suffering? To let others see our victories? To let others see in a little to who we are? What we're attempting for the Lord? Where I'm hurting? Where I'm struggling? Where things just aren't working out right and I don't know why God's not making them work out right and I just need someone to talk to but I'm too ashamed to say that I'm having some doubts right now so I don't go with my brothers and sisters in Christ. That's not what the church is about. The church is about the growth and edification of the saints so we'll be equipped for the works of ministry that God has called us to do. The good that he's called us to do, he laid that out before the foundations of the earth were laid. He had good works marked out for us to do and he's equipping us to do them. But if we cut ourselves off from all of the nourishment and all of the teaching and the fellowship of believers, we won't be as effective. We'll be weaker. 
will be easily tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. When any liar with a little bit of charisma and some skinny jeans and some slick back hair gets up in the pulpit and doesn't even look, need to preach with notes and walks all around with his mic and tells us the great things that God has for us, we're like, oh, without one thought that maybe we ought to weigh what I'm hearing from this prophet against the words of God. We need each other, amen? Don't we need each other? We're supposed to love each other. In fact, the sign to the world that we are disciples of Jesus Christ is that we have love one for another. Not even necessarily for all of them. That, that command was for believers. The, the way we love each other should show people that Jesus is, is our Savior and our King and our Lord. That's, that's the indicator that we are the true church of God, that we love one another. And everything in society pulls us away from face-to-face -face interaction, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I can text you far easier than I can call you even or drive over. Texting's so safe. If you call them, you might have to get into a conversation. Yeah. That's what I've heard. I don't know. I'm, I'm just anxious to call all of y'all. Um, it's easy to hide these days. So in each local church, there will be unbelievers posing as Christians. And that will be exposed in fellowship. That will be exposed in ministry. Uh, you'll know. They'll be exposed. And, and, and why do we want them exposed? Because they need to hear the true gospel. If someone's wandering around lost and they think that they're born again, we need to share with them the true gospel. It's important that we see it. It's important that we see it in them. It's important that we address it in love. It's important that we look at ourselves so in the local church, there's going to be disbelievers posing as believers and Christians who look like unbelievers because they're immature and don't devote themselves to the study of God's Word. So how do we know the real deal? Well, we'll know them by their fruit. A biblical trust in Jesus Christ, for one thing. This is what a believer looks like. A biblical trust in Christ. What does that mean to trust in Christ? It means that I trust that Jesus Christ is God in flesh. Amen? Amen? Anyone? Okay. Jesus Christ is God in flesh. That God took on flesh and came here for a purpose. What was that purpose? Well, it's twofold actually. One, to live the perfect sinless life that I can never live. And two, to get on a sinner's cross having lived that sinful perfect life and to pay my price for my sin. That's why he came. Do you believe that today? Do you believe? Is that why? Here's a caveat to that. There is no other way for you to be forgiven by God than through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. No other way. What if I confess? Confession is useless without the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. You can list your sins to God all day, and he's not forgiving you unless you trust in the Son. Because the Son is your propitiation. He's the high priest who stands there having paid the price for you and advocating for you before the Father. If you don't love the Son, a biblical trust in the biblical Jesus Christ, God in flesh, whew, the payment for our sins, ascended to the right hand of the Father, alive, alive. Jesus says alive. Whew, man. Next, obedience to God's Word in both deed and attitude. That's what a Christian looks like. Will they always be perfect? No, of course not. <laughs> of course not. But our obedience will be increasing. We'll look to the Word of God for guidance on issues. That's what real Christians do. What should I think about this? I don't know. Let me go to the Word of God. Not... Here's what I think about this. Let me see if the, if the Word of God agrees with me, which is far too often what we do. Oh, can I find a verse wildly out of context that supports whatever I'm postulating right now? You probably can. Look at the world through the lens of Scripture because everything around us is lies and deceit and the work of the enemy and darkness that caters to our flesh and looks really attractive, but is not the Word of God. Be careful. Be discerning. Be wise. Be sober. 
The enemy prowls around like a roaring lion waiting for anyone to devour. Don't be that guy. Don't be alone. A man alone is easy prey. What happens when the enemy comes to consume you and you're standing there with seven of your brothers bearing the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God? Seven brothers and sisters standing around you. You're the mark. He shows up. you got seven brothers or sisters standing around you with swords. He's going to go find easy prey. Because he's a coward and he's a liar. And he'll find the Christian that's going to go off and do it in nature by themselves and he'll get them. Man, the power of fellowship. Okay, next. Uh, um, obedience to God's word, both deed, your attitude is, is godly. A love for God's word and Christian fellowship, a love for this book. Do we worship the book? No. But the one we worship wrote the book. Amen? Isn't that right? He wrote the book. A love for the word. Do I want to be wise? I consult the scriptures. Do I want to be strong? I consult the scriptures. Do I want to have something to add to the argument? I consult the Scriptures. Am I looking for how I can get out of this miserable season of my life? I consult the Scriptures. And my brothers and sisters. And I pray. And I call the pastor. And I call my deacon. And I go to whoever in the fellowship I know is walking with Christ. And I lay it out on the line with them. We are in this together. And we must base everything on the Word of God. And finally, a true and continual repentance. You cannot be perfect. But the Christian is constantly repenting of sin. Constantly. I, I, I repent, Lord. I confess my attitude. Help me not to have that attitude anymore. Sanctify me. Make me more like Christ. I know you never had that attitude. Lord, if you have to pray that 15 times a day, pray it 15 times a day in faith. In faith what? One, that God loves you. And two, He's answering your prayer. He's working on it. The very fact that you're going to Him means He's working with you on that issue. Amen. Aren't you glad we have a loving God who's patient and kind? Who wants His children to come to Him and say, Dad, how can I do this better? Dad, what would you have me to do? I have no clue, Dad, how to face this. How can I, Dad, walk with me? Dad, be with me. And he's like, oh, of course I got, got you, boy, you noogie, whatever, right? And just walking with you and loving you. God is not standing there with a whip getting ready to, ready to crack you across the head when you come to him in repentance. That's not what the scriptures say. God loves a contrite heart. That's what he looks for. Talk about mercy. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He doesn't want you to come to church with unrepentant sin on your account, right? He wants to show you mercy before you sacrifice. Turn to him and receive the mercy. Walk boldly into the throne room of mercy and grace and find grace in the time of your need. That's what born-again Christians do. Amen? Isn't that what we do? I respect my dad, but I'm not afraid of him. Got to be careful saying that. We should be afraid of God a little. Shouldn't we be a little? Afraid of God? I mean, I was a little bit afraid of my dad. <laughs> Anybody a little bit afraid of your dad? You can say. A little bit. Why? Because there's that moment, right? That moment when you've pushed it just a little bit too far. That moment when the fun stops and the discipline starts. There's that moment. Hebrews 12 tells us that God has those moments. And our job when we get disciplined by the Lord is, yes, Father. Right? Yes, Father. Sometimes I think that we walk around the planet thinking God exists for us rather than that we exist for Him. That I'm a Christian because Jesus will bless my life as I live that I'm hunting for as many, I'm grabbing as many of his blessings as I can, that I'm living in a way where I'm trying to position myself where he'll bless me. Mm. That's not how Jesus lived. 
right? Jesus had a mission. Glorify the Father in every circumstance. Glorify the Father in hardship. Glorify the Father in times of plenty. Glorify the Father in times of need. Glorify the Father when I'm tired. Glorify the Father when I'm not tired. Glorify the Father when I'm being confronted. Glorify the Father when I'm being abused. Glorify the Father when I'm being beaten. Glorify the Father when I'm being crucified. Glorify the Father when they're praising me. Glorify the Father when they're hating me. Glorify the Father when I'm working. Glorify the Father when I'm sleeping. Glorify the Father. And he did it perfectly every moment of his life. Christians shouldn't live as if God exists to glorify them or to help them or to bless them. If salvation is not enough blessing for you, you need to re-examine the scriptures for just a minute. On the heels of that, will God bless you? Yeah, yes, yes. Who's been more blessed by God than you can even list? You couldn't even list the blessings of the Father. Our God is good. Amen? Amen. He's a good and faithful Father who lavishes, Ephesians tells, lavishes His grace upon us. Lavishly. We don't deserve any of it, but He pours it out on us. He will bless you. And it's almost like the Israelites testing God in the time of, of, of the Exodus when we're trying to count how he's blessed us and put it on a list and see where he can bless us more and take an inventory of the blessings and seeing where we need more blessings. That's almost sacrilegious, isn't it? It's, 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 trust God to bless you. Live in ways that are pleasing to him and just let the blessings come. He's going to bless you. He's going to bless you. Jesus keeps true believers secure in the faith. This continued repentance. Here's the nature of our faith. Jesus keeps believers secure in the faith and in fellowship. Uh, If you fall away from faith, look up there in verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest any any of you have an evil and unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. That's an unregenerate person being driven away from the Lord so that they don't come to saving faith. All right? But the true believer can also, our heart is going to take us away from true doctrine, and that's really where Christians fall uh, into trouble. Um, If you can fall away from faith, if you can stop trusting Jesus, it's called deconstruction these days. If you can stop trusting Jesus, I got news for you, you were never in saving faith in the first place. If you genuinely just decide, I'm not having faith in Jesus anymore, you didn't have faith in the first place, because faith is uh, an act of God, Um, Jesus Christ keeps us in the faith when we're truly regenerate and and we've believed in him. Let's read here Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Before the world was created, God chose you to be holy, if you're born again, to be holy and blameless before him. He he forgives all of your unrighteousness. He equips you to worship. He keeps you holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. He's holding you in righteousness. Next verse, Jude. Jude. There's only one chapter in Jude. That's why it says 24 through, it should say 24 through 25. Um, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Who's able to do that? Well, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority 
before all time and now and forever. Amen. Jude 24 through 25. Right? It, he's able to, keep, he keeps you from stumbling. He presents you blameless before him for his glory and by his will. And finally, John 6, uh, verses 37 and 39, we go to Jesus, Jesus' own words on the matter. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Think about that for a second. Some of your scriptures, I will in no wise cast out. I think that's how the King James says it, right? All who come to me, I will never cast out. If you come to Jesus in saving faith, when will he cast you out? Never. What if I really do a bad thing? He'll cast you out. Never. Never. Never unless you're good enough? No, no, no. Never means never. The words in the Bible mean something. Never. If you're born again, he will never cast you out. As much as I threaten to kick my kids out on the street, <laughs> my wife laughs because she knows I'm a big puff dragon boy. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. Weak. Yeah, soft, <laughs> you know. Never. I'll never stop loving my kids. They'll never stop being my kids. No matter what they do. They'll never not be a Philkin, sorry. And that's me. What about Yahweh? What about your Heavenly Father? You come to Him in saving faith and He adopts you as one of His children and He will... If you mess up, he, he unadopts you? Where's that verse? Where's that verse? I don't know. I, I don't read that verse ever, but I read this verse a lot. I will never cast them out. And this is the will of him who sent me, God the Father, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. So everyone that comes to Jesus is sent by the Father God the Father gives us to God the Son as an inheritance. He'll never cast us out once we come to Him. And this is the will of God who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that He has given me. But here's what I will do. I will raise it up on the last day. Amen. Woo. Man, isn't that awesome? Written in stone for you, saint. Written in blood. Jesus' blood. I will never cast you out. I will raise you up on the last day. You can go to a million scriptures. You can go to Romans 8, you know. Those he, those he chose, he predestined. Those he predestined, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. It's a done deal. You will be glorified. It's called the golden chain. Aren't you glad we serve a God that doesn't change his mind on loving us? That doesn't change his mind on saving us? Today, we've just been presented, even in these short few minutes, with the option to live for eternity with Jesus and to worship Him. My question for you is, do you believe Him? Do you love Him? Do you? Do you love Christ? I didn't ask anything about your behavior. Behavior is not even going to come into this chain of questioning. Do you love Jesus Christ as God and Lord and Savior? Do you trust Him alone for your salvation? Are you confident that He's a promise keeper and that if you're His, you're His and He loves you and He's saved you and He's redeemed you and He's seek you out and saved you? Do you believe that today? If you don't have an assurance of what's going to happen to you for the rest of eternity, do you want to believe that today? Do you want to trust Jesus Christ? Do you want that assurance? Here's what it's going to take. Belief. Believe in Jesus, God the Son. Believe in His sacrifice for you. Throw yourself on His mercy. Trust Him to deliver you. Trust Him to save you. Call on Him to save you. And He will. Amen, Saint. Won't He? Everyone 
who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, and he will in no way cast you out. Amen. What a good and gracious and magnificent God we serve. Let's take a look at Hebrews 3, 15 through 19. Are you contemplating whether Christianity is for you? You're asking yourself the wrong question. We do not offer you the chance to be part of a religion. We offer you the chance to be saved through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and to walk with him as a disciple. Do you want, do you want to do that? Do you want, do you want, do you want to do that? that? That's what we're calling you to, not a religion. Let's take a look. Religion won't help you, verses 15 through 19. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. God's calling you, don't harden your heart. Give in. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient, so that they were unable to enter? Why? Because of their disbelief, their unbelief. Unbelief will keep you out of the kingdom of God. You must believe on Jesus the Son. If you don't believe on Jesus the Son, no amount of religion will save you. No amount of rule keeping will save you. No amount of do-gooding will save you. You must believe in the Son. You must trust Him. Don't harden your heart. In just a few short moments, we're going to give an opportunity. If, If you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to be born again, if you want to be saved, we will talk to you. We will pray with you. We will coach you through that process of coming to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Don't let the moment pass. Come up. In just a, you can come up now if you want to, but come up when the music starts in just a moment. Just a moment. So, true belief looks like all of those things. But let's read Hebrews 4, 1 through 3. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of us should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them. Here's why they weren't saved. Ready? Here it comes. Good news came to us, just as it did to them, like it's coming to you now. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For those, for we who have believed enter that rest as he has said. You hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You hear it proclaimed. When you believe, you are saved. Notice there's nothing in there that says when you start acting right, you are saved. Notice there's nothing in there that says when you start, when you make a promise to come to church X number of weeks during the year, will you be saved. It's it's not in the Scriptures. It doesn't exist in the Scriptures. For we who have believed enter that rest. And that's the next point. Through true belief, we enter in an eternal Sabbath rest from the works of the flesh. We enter into an eternal Sabbath rest from the works of the flesh. What does that mean? We stop having to be trying to please God. Trying to win God's favor. Trying to impress Him with our goodness. Trying to earn glory trying to earn righteousness, trying to earn the right to stand in heaven, trying to earn the right to be in His family. Those are works of the flesh, and they lead to death, not life. You can't earn it. It must be given as a gift through grace, through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's a gift that Jesus offers you, and when you receive it, you're saved. It's that simple. It's that simple. We enter into a Sabbath rest. Let's read Hebrews 4, starting in verse 4. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way. <laughs> this is funny, and just, just real quick. This is a sermon, Hebrews, and the preacher's preaching, and he's so carried away that he forgot where he found that in Scripture. He just said, oh, somewhere in Scripture it says, you can just hear him carried away. For somewhere it was spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from his works. And again, the passage said, they shall not enter my rest. 
The rest of God. The rest where God's in charge. Where you trust God for your salvation. Verse 6, Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter it because of disobedience, which is disbelief. Verse 7, Again, he appoints a certain day. Today. Saying through David, so long afterward, and these words already quoted today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, verse 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Who's the Sabbath rest for? The people of God. Born again. Verse 10, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. That's why I say, we don't invite you into a Christian religion where you have to do X, Y, and Z. We invite you into a relationship with Jesus Christ where you walk. Here's how Christianity works. You don't show up, you got a list of 10 things, you got to accomplish these 10 things. Here's what's so scary about Christianity. Christianity works like this. He says, go. And you walk. <laughs> You're like, where's the list of 10 things? He goes, I don't have the list of 10 things. Just walk. You're like, oh. And we walk by faith, not by sight. So here we go. Walk. Uh-oh. And Jesus says, <clears throat> turn right. What? Turn right. Why? I didn't say why. I said turn right. That's the challenge of Christianity. You walk. When the Holy Spirit says do it, you do it. You don't ask questions. You just do it. And you go. And you're in the Scriptures. And you're reading the Word. And you're praying with the saints. But you're walking in obedience to whatever the Lord tells you to do. Whatever He tells you to do will comport with everything written in this book. That's how you know His voice. Amen? Isn't that right? He won't tell you to do something he hasn't written in the book for you to do. He won't, he won't tell you to deviate. He won't give you a new revelation. We don't need a new revelation. God has given us everything we need for life and righteousness, and it's right here. And as you walk, you will hear a voice behind you, Isaiah says. Oh man, it's so good. You'll hear a voice behind you saying, turn to the right, turn to the left. It's right there in Isaiah. Obey the voice. Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. If he's saying, come to me, come to him. It's the right thing to do, amen? Isn't it the right thing to do? It's the right thing to do. He'll tell you what to do. Good stuff. So we rest from our works. We rest from reading the map and we let him just kind of guide and direct us, all right? So true belief, we enter... Uh, uh, a true believer is in that Sabbath rest where we just trust God for stuff and we just obey His Word and we just walk. We walk by faith. Third, lastly, last thing here. True belief reflects God's Word. And our, God's Word tells us that we're depraved and He's righteous. That, that's what it tells us. Let, let's go ahead and read verses 11 through 13 and then we're done. Let's therefore strive to enter that rest. Let's trust God, right? Let, let, let's strive to enter that rest. I want to I rest in you, Lord God. I don't want to strive for my own righteousness, right? Let, let's strive to enter that rest, verse 11, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience, which is disbelief in Christ. Verse 12, it's according to the Word of God, right? For the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. What does that tell us? As we walk through this world, we're equipped. We have a weapon. We have a defensive weapon, an offensive weapon, right? Piercing the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intention of the heart. What did God say? Search yourself. See if you're in the faith. See if your thoughts honor the Lord. See if your intentions honor the Lord. Because the unregenerate heart, Jeremiah tells us, is desperately sick. Right? But the regenerate heart, the new heart, we have to weigh the intentions of the heart. Verse 13, against the Word of God. And no creature is hidden from its sight. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. What are we free from where we started today? I'm free from having to stand before God and give an account of every sin that I committed. Amen. Aren't you glad? He's going to open up that book and there's like appendices in the book with Tim's sins. Oh, Tim's sins? Oh, Appendix X. Right? So we got to go because Tim's got... So, 
I'm not going to be accountable for every sin. He's going to open the book of life and he's going to see my name in that book. Let me go to the book. Let me see. Tim's name is in the book of life. We have to give an account to God. And your account's either going to be, I'm in Christ, or I did the best I could. Those are your two arguments. There's only one argument that gets you into glory, and it's, I'm in Christ. I'm in Christ. I trust in Christ. I trust in Christ's righteousness. Yeah, I messed up. He's like, I know. Look at that. Look at that. (laughs) But I love you because you're in Christ. In closing, final thought. Saint, love the word, be in the word, weigh your motives and intentions and actions against the word of God and strive to enter that rest where we're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and we are walking righteously. Just strive to enter in. But if you're sitting out there and you don't even know who this Jesus is, the only way to enter the rest of God where you no longer have to compete and try and earn your way into a place you can never earn your way into is through placing your faith in Jesus Christ. And as the singers come and as the players come, if you would please, these next few moments as we sing, if you'd like to come talk to me about making that decision to serve Jesus Christ with your life and to accept his forgiveness, please come do that. If you're a saint and you want to come and lay it all at the altar and and just pray for a fresher walk and a a motivated heart and righteous living, just come come and do that. And pray in your seat. But as the music plays, please respond to the Holy Spirit. And if you hear the Holy Spirit's voice today, please don't harden your heart as we sing.